morning, everyone. And um, I was told a few weeks ago that um, people who are participating in the Buddhist bike pilgrimage, uh, a few of them are supposed to start here today at 11 o'clock and do a trial run or something like that, the practice run. And so I was asked to give a little talk that had maybe related to their endeavors. And uh, it's been going on for many years, this Buddhist bike pilgrimage. And uh, maybe someday it'll be recognized as California's El Camino. You know, that sacred site. And many people come from all over the world to do this, you know, sacred bike pilgrimage. They usually end up at a monastery. And uh, often for many years they go to Abhayagiri Monastery in Ukiah. And sometimes they go to the nuns in, in uh, Auburn. So um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about a, a teaching called the Five Faculties. And uh, these are important inner capacities or abilities that we have that come into play in just about any activity humans do. So I've often used, and talking about them, used bicycle riding as an example of how they come into play. So um, that's a little bit the connection between the theme and the, the bike bicyclists who are here, maybe. And um, the um, <clears throat> and so we have these wonderful abilities within us, and. Uh, you know, the lived life that we experience, that we live, uh, has a very important genesis within inside of ourselves. And to discover the lived life, the sense of living that flows and moves from the in, uh, and discover it there in a profound and meaningful way, uh, means that that profundity and that meaning is something we can take with us anywhere we go. If you're looking for the meaning and purpose of our life externally in, t- in the world, uh, then uh, it probably isn't so portable. But if uh, we discovered within something meaningful and wonderful, then um, you know we can. It's always with us. And so, uh, discovering some of the things that are operating inside, some of the faculties, abilities, capacities, states that uh, are in here recognizing them, understanding them, and uh, finding value in them so that they become our companions uh, along this journey of life. So the five faculties are among these things that uh, exist within us. And um, the five faculties, uh, the Pali word, the ancient word for it is Indriya. And Indriya uh, means something like uh, belonging to the god Indra. And uh, Indra was supposed to be one of the supreme gods of the ancient Indian pantheon who had some kind of ability to control things. And so the fact that we have a little divinity within us that is able to control what goes on, uh, kind of guide what goes on, support what goes on, a faculty, uh, is kind of a, saying a beautiful thing, I think, that to have you know, associated with the divinity that it's something inside of ourselves. Buddhists don't usually say there's a divinity within, but uh, we have Indras in, within. <laughs> and so um, the, um, and so these five are, um, usually in English it's translated as faith, energy or effort, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom to offer a little different uh, version of a translation that uh, in my mind, my heart represents some of the fullness or the depth or the richness in which these things can exist within us. Uh, I think of it as deep trust, deep engagement, deep honesty, deep stability, and deep insight. So, Trust, engagement, honesty, stability, and insight. And uh, so how do these work? Uh, what are they? So for this, I'd like to use a couple of uh, 
you know, similes or metaphors for them. And that is, um, if someone wants, has a pr uh, plot of land that's parched, pretty sterile, hasn't been cultivated for a long time, hard pan soil, and would like to garden, make a garden there, but knows nothing about gardening. And so the person tells a bunch of friends, you know, I want to have this plot of land, I would like to garden, but it just seems too daunting. It's hard pan, it's nothing's there growing there, and I don't know anything about gardening, and you know, who am I? I don't know if I can do it. I don't know if the, the plot of land is suitable for gardening. And, and, um, and anyway, it's more, more effort than I think I could do. And uh, so then five friends show up, and, um, and they say, you know, we'll help. <clears throat> and each friend has a different <clears throat> strength that carries along everyone in, to make this project work. One of them has a phenomenal confidence, trust, faith, that it can be done. It can be turned into a garden. Maybe the person's never gardened before, but they've been around gardeners and seen in the world how this can be done and seen uh, plots of land in much worse condition. And so the enthusiasm this person has just kind of sparks everyone. And uh, the other per another person has a lot of wisdom, a lot of understanding about soil and what kind of soil it is. Is it sandy? Is it clay? How you would treat different soil? How you'd break a hard pan? Um, what, what, what's needed to add to it? How you would condition the soil, how you plant in it, and has a lot of wisdom about how to deal with different soil types and different terrains. And so that person can give very specific instructions. This is how we do it here. There's another person who's like built like an ox, you know, like big and strong and full of, you know, energy. Can never meditate or sit down because it's just like, you know, packed full of energy. And, um, and so that person just raring to go, you know, to get, give me an axe, pickaxe, a shovel, I'm going to get to work. And that person's, you know, energy and, you know, dedication just kind of like, it's like an, in the engine that drives everybody else, the person who works so hard. And another person um, has a, a concentration or stability. Uh, the person with lots of energy gets distracted easily. And but the person with the concentration just keeps the focus, and everyone kind of gathers around that focus, and stays present, stays present. And then the fifth friend is the one who's really mindful, really aware of the whole scene, what's going on, is able to somehow bring together everyone else in harmony. They work together, pull out the strength of each one, um, is able to track the time and when it's time for lunch, and you know, it's kind of kind of can get the bigger you know scene of what's going on and recognizes when the ox is working too hard and you need to take a break and and when the one when the one on with faith is only just kind of sitting around not doing nothing because it's so enthusiastic <laughs> and uh, you know gets gets to do, do some work or, you know so the mindful one you know is very important so these five friends you know make it possible for this garden to happen so we have five friends that are available inside of ourselves and to recognize these five friends and call on them and engage in them um, is a beautiful thing, wonderful thing. It's wonderful to recognize them. And sometimes that's enough. Wow, I have this inside. I have these friends inside. Isn't that good? I thought I was lonely, but now I have these friends. And they were inside. And then the other is uh, one thing to recognize them. The other is sometimes to engage them, to spark them and make them present for what we're going to do. And as I said, they're present in all activities that humans do, some degree, uh, even the most mundane. But we don't, wouldn't think about them because, you know, just we do things so easily out of habit. But like bicycle riding, if you were going to bike from here to Santa Barbara and down Highway One, uh, you would um, these five would come into play. Uh, first of all, you'd have to have some trust, some faith, you can do it, and that it can be done. And, um, and uh, I suspect that uh, if someone told me that uh, we're going to bike down to you know, Santa Barbara, you, know, you want to come along, uh, I would have some doubt that I could do it, especially at the speed in which they're going to go, or maybe, I, you know, I'm, or the pilgrimage. I'm not really in bicycle shape, even though I bike down here today. 
And so I have some doubt about, you know, I'm not, I'm not in condition. I have to train for that. And, uh, but then, I, you know, I train, and after being training and preparing, then I have some confidence and faith that I could do it. And when that, I tip over into having confidence, then uh, there might be actually a spark of enthusiasm. I'm inspired. Yes, I want to do this. This sounds great. Going down that winding road in Big Sur, that's like the best. And um, so, um, uh, and then uh, as you bike along, you have to kind of track your effort level, your energy level. And it's kind of intuitive for many bike, bike riders, and they don't think about it so much, but uh, the system is tracking this. And so if you see a big hill coming up, uh, you might want to pick up some speed on the flat to get, get some momentum. As you're going up, you have to change the gears, you have to maybe change how you make effort, and uh, really apply yourself. Um, the, uh, I, I live up in the hills here, and when I bike up that hill, it's kind of takes some effort. <laughs> and um, and takes a lot of faith that I can do it. There's a last little piece sometimes, some, when I go up in the hills sometimes. Can I really do this? <laughs> really? You know, but you know, I have to, Gail, you know, just put more effort. And so I put more effort and I make it. And, and uh, so that's nice. And, um, but then you come to the top and you know the effort has to change. And you can, uh, and then going downhill, you make a very different effort. I don't kind of get, get go all out, huffing and puffing, going downhill. I kind of catch my breath, I rest, I coast down the hill. So it's, a, you know, vary the effort we make. Um, the, um, there has to be a lot of mindfulness, awareness. If you get, if it, mindfulness has a lot to do with being undistracted. If you're distracted, riding down Highway 1 on a bike, you're not going to get to Santa Barbara, or you know, to the monastery up north if you go. You can't be, you have to be undistracted if you're riding a bike. And uh, your attention has to be alert, you have to have it 360 degrees, you have to see the road in front of you, the conditions of the road, the traffic, the curves, the hills, the gravel, you know, all kinds of things. I remember once coming down a when I was a kid, coming down a hill, and I had to make a turn at the bottom of the hill, and I somehow I didn't know that gravel is relevant for bicyclists. <laughs> I was too young, I, inexperienced, I had no wisdom yet, and um, and next thing I found myself on the ground, and bicycles you know spun out from under me, you know, slipped from under me, under me. so. Um, and then there were the, the train tracks or the trolley tracks on the road I didn't know about either. So that was, you know, so it's all kinds of things you need to know. So you have to track all this stuff and be aware of all this. And um, so the, the, uh, there has to be awareness. And so a, a bicyclist might slip up a little bit and get distracted and lost in fantasy and something happens and say, oh, I can't do that again. Um, I have to be alert. And then, uh, it, you know, it takes some concentration to uh, do a long bike trip. Uh, concentration has a lot to do with persistence, continuity. Just keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. Keep making the effort, keep making the effort. Stay there, stay there. And some people, when they go on uh, you know, great hikes, runs, bicycle trips, it's uh, some of the great pleasure of doing that is in fact getting into the zone, getting into a concentrated state where the mind is not really distracted anymore but you really feel like you're present in a continuous, alert, clear way. And uh, it's just a great pleasure in life to have that. And then uh, finally, there has to be a lot of wisdom when you do a bike trip. Uh, you, can, you, know, you have to know about the gravel, you have to know about the trolley tracks and what to do there. You have to know how to read the traffic and look up ahead and there's a, a wet spot and what you do with the wet spot. Or you have to know what, what to take with you and what not to take with you. And, um, you know how to, if it's a big you know, pilgrimage with lots of people, you know, have, to be, have wisdom about how close you can get to uh, the other people who are riding. Because um, I've known of big accidents. That, I think I was in one when I was a kid also. I did a lot of bicycle accidents when I was a kid. And I think uh, riding side by side um, with someone and talking and doing what kids do side by side, this is not a good idea because it can be on the ground again. Bump the handlebars hit each other or something. <coughs> 
So there has to be some wisdom and understanding of how all this works. And, um, and so maybe my examples are not the best ones, but maybe you can fill in better for yourself. That these are five faculties we have that are coming into play. And they probably come into play when you're washing dishes at home. But you know, that's just rote almost, so you don't even think about it. But you have some confidence, you have the effort, you have some, atten- some attention when you do dishes. Uh, I've known to break dishes in my kitchen sink if I'm not paying careful attention. So you, know, you need some. And then uh, some concentration, and then some wisdom about it. And uh, so, so in recognizing these things within us, and recognizing how they work, um, it can be a delight. Wow, look at that. I, I, I have trust, I have confidence, and this inspiration there. And the effort thing, for some people have a complicated relationship with effort, um, but uh, our ability to engage uh, you know, that's where a lot of the pleasure of life comes. Uh, I think of in meditation, myself, I think of it more as an engagement of something we, I do. Uh, and the doing is mostly an undoing. Mostly a kind of uh, the doing of letting go of all the doings of my mind. But it's still a doing. And I just delight in it. I just think it's so much fun when you know, I get into it. And, um, and, you know, and, and to kind of track my mind and have faith in what I'm doing, have the effort to apply myself at not doing, to have awareness that tracks it all, that has a continuity of practice, a concentration of what I'm doing, and then a real insight and wisdom of what's happening, insight into the coming and going of phenomena, and knowing where, where insight about where, wisdom about where, with my attention, uh, so that I can get less and less caught up, less attached. Let the mind become more peaceful and clear and more subtle. I just find it one of the, uh, not always, but, but um, I find it one of the great delights. One of the ways that it's a delight to meditate works the same, th- same way if I go for a bike ride or go for a run in the hills here. Sometimes, the first few minutes are a drag. <laughs> really, I'm going to do. I'm going to run up this hill, you know. And and then I don't know about if this is a comment for other people, but maybe I'm peculiar. But um, I start my run going up in the hills here, <clears throat> and uh, there's something in my body, some physical kind of sensations, that uh, feels like. A screaming kid saying, stop. <laughs> and uh, I have enough experience with this little kid inside, this, this physical sensations, to, to know that this is not something to live, listen to. <clears throat> so I have to persist. I have to override it in a certain way. And sometimes when I sit down to meditate, the same thing happens. It's not the little kid exactly, but um, I don't really want to have my mind stop what it's preoccupied with. And, I have important things to think about, right? And, um, and so, so it takes a couple of minutes to kind of get into it. But as I get into it, and the usual preoccupations of the mind quiet down, and some of the protests of the mind quiet down, then uh, it's such a pleasure to get into kind of the flow of the engagement, the effort just being there, and to have these different faculties uh, come into play. To have a real sense of being inspired which is a correlate of being having faith or confidence or trust, is a real, real delight. It's a gift to have that kind of friend inside. To enjoy making effort. Like, this is fun. It's almost, some people actually think about meditation as kind of like play. I don't quite see it as play, but I'm kind of delighted and amused by it. And then uh, to find real joy in the mind's capacity for clarity, for being awake and aware and present. To have uh, real joy in, uh, that arises if we kind of settle in to a continuity of practice. It's kind of like we're in the groove or in the zone. It's just like one of the great joys. It's, it just seems like almost like there's a physio- like a cat being stroked. You know, why does a cat purr when it gets stroked? Not, you know. No one's actually told me yet. I don't really know. It's just the cat, I guess, is enjoying it. Um, the, um, 
but uh, why do I start kind of lighting up with joy when I'm just kind of getting concentrated on my breath or my meditation? Um, I don't really know why. It just seems like it's not a reason. It's not like an evaluation or idea that it's a good thing and I'm happy about it. Uh, it seems like I'm being stroked. You know, I'm being stroked by awareness. Mindfulness is stroking me and the system begins to purr. And then uh, to have insight is one of the best things. Uh, I, I uh, oscillate between being delighted and amused when I can really have clarity of mind and to see the terrain of what happens in the mind and around me. There's something about seeing uh, phenomena, thoughts, feelings, experiences arise and pass. The clarity of seeing something exist that didn't exist and something that didn't exist, now it doesn't exist. Something that did exist, now it doesn't exist in momentary arising and passing of things. There's something that I find immensely delightful in that. I think what I find delightful is the clarity of leaving it alone, of not getting attached to it, not holding on to it. It just exists and I'm free of it, just right there. And, uh, and that, I think, is one of the greatest things to have um, the five faculties involved, involved in. The five faculties to be involved uh, in our capacity to not get caught in our experience, our thoughts, our feelings. Our capacity for the mind, to, the heart to be free. And for that to become second nature, to be such a common endeavor of the five faculties, it's kind of, we take it with us all, all the places we go, to have faith that no matter where we go, um, the best thing we can do is not to get, not to cling, not to resist, not to clamp down and get contracted, but to stay free and open. The best things we can, one of the best things we can do is to put in the effort to stay free. One of the best things we can do is to stay, have the mindfulness and clarity that helps that freedom to be there, to be an opening to express our life and understand our life. To have the concentration on this effort to be free, to have the wisdom to be free. That's one of the best things going. And there might be protests that, no, no, there's better things, or that's kind of like, you know, that's, um, that's uh, self-serving or self-indulging and, you know, to, to focus on your own freedom and there's important things to do in the world and all that. It, it's, it's not like either or. To discover the freedom of the heart and the mind, that becomes the vehicle within which we do everything in our life. It's not that we don't exclude everything else. It's the medium in which we can live our life and take care of all these other important things that we take care of. And to have that be second nature, just like maybe it's second nature for some of you to walk. And you know, you don't think about walking, but you walk for many reasons. You, you don't set up an either or scenario. Um, I'm either gonna walk uh, or I'm going to go to the store. You know, no, you can't walk because you have an important place to go. You have to go to the store. <laughs> so you're stuck, you know, you can't walk because you can't do both. It's ridiculous, right? Um, so the same thing with this freedom of the heart and the freedom of the mind that Buddhism kind of reveals for us, the practice reveals, and uh, is that uh, it's something we can always do and everything else we do can come along and be part of that. It's not, not an either or. And it turns out that nothing whatsoever is worth, is worth clinging to. And we should all whistle at that. So nothing whatsoever is worth clinging to. And so to discover, the, it's even beginning the rudimentary, small discoveries of what it's like not to cling and not to close down, not to get tight around things, not to get tight around resisting things in, in the mind, to discover what that is, and then to it, relate to those things with the five faculties. To discover, to awaken faith and inspiration around non-clinging, 
to have the effort to live a life of non-clinging, to have the awareness that supports that, to have the concentration on doing it, and to have the wisdom that this is a good idea, is a great thing to have. So five faculties needed for your bike trip, those of you going, and needed for meditation, and needed for freedom. May the five faculties be your friends for your discovery of freedom. So those are my thoughts. And um, in 15 minutes, there's a potluck. So what I'd like to propose, since we have 15 minutes before the potluck, is to do what we often do before the potluck, is, uh, but then to add something to it. So you, I... So the first uh, is to just turn to, uh, uh, you know, have one or two people next to you and, and just have a little conversation about these five faculties or what do you know about your five faculties? Have you appreciated them before? Have they have a role in your life? Can you imagine they can have a bigger role in your life, especially in terms of meditation or especially in terms of uh, living a life that doesn't cling to things? And just have, share a little conversation. and. Don't have one person give a long monologue about everything they can possibly say about this. It's mostly about making a connection. And so just kind of say just a few words, let it go back and forth, ping pong kind of thing. And then uh, after we've done that a few minutes, uh, then we'll regather, I'll ring the bell, we'll, we'll regather here, and I'll say, say some fi- final words uh, before the potluck. Okay? So why don't you, you join up with a couple of people and have a little conversation. And, <laughs>